Muito bem. A próxima conferência será dada para Julio Rebelo, da PUC do Rio. Ele vai falar sobre técnicas de renormalização para campos de vectores e aplicações. Obrigado. So first I should say that it's a pleasure to participate in this conference, celebrating Cesar's birthday. And I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity. Since today is conference last day, you have already heard many references to Cesar's personality and work. And since I don't want to be redundant, I will be very brief. Well, as you know, Cesar made a large contribution to Brazilian mathematics by being the pioneer in this country of the area of holomorphic foliations. I assume that in the beginning he must have been alone, but still he went on. He was the supervisor of several students and he encouraged many others. And today I think he has gotten Brazilian collaborators who owes him a great debt. As to encouraging students, I have a personal recollection. Although formally I never been his student, he was always very supportive with me, in particular helping my move to France for graduation. Here should be considered also that I had at that time specific difficulties with some administrative rules here in Brazil. Difficulties that, by the way, are familiar to Cesar. Remember that? <laughs> and he was very supportive and very helpful with me. As to his work, uh, as I said, I don't want to be redundant. So I just make a couple of remarks. I just want to single out a couple of his contributions. One is the minimal set problem that is, in my opinion, an amazing statement in the sense that it's very general, it's of obvious importance, it's easy to state, and so on. There are also related results to the minimal set problem, which are due to Cesar, to Robert Moussou, and their collaborators. Despite these results, I want to add that I really hope we far from a solution for this problem. Because my feeling, or I believe at least, that when time will be rip to solve this problem, we'll have achieved a new level in the comprehension of objects like holomorphic functions, holomorphic foliations. So I definitely don't want any shortcut to appear and lead immediately, and maybe not naturally, to the solution of this problem. I believe it's a problem that might point in the direction of a true advance. Another aspect of Cesar's work I'd like to very briefly mention is index-related problems. So, roughly speaking, they could be presented as uh, something concerned with the linearization of a foliation on the neighborhood of a periodic orbit. And, well, this explains why they kind of ubiquitous in the field. I don't have, I don't need to make any specific comment on index since they are going to show up naturally in what I plan to discuss in a few minutes. So, uh, in closing, in the speaking also in the name of the Catholic University, I would like to tell Camacho of our appreciation for his contribution and wish him a continuation of his career. Okay, now switching to the object of my talk. What I'll be talking about sits inside a global picture or a global way to look at say, algebraic manifolds and foliations, and their foliations, if you like. Well, as you know, there is this quadrilateral dimension, this object called, this invariant called quadrilateral dimension, that provides a systematic way 
to look at manifolds and also admits a foliated version that allows you to consider foliations more or less in the same line. Of course, the problem for foliations is much harder in that manifolds are always easier as they primary and kind of static objects. Foliations live inside manifolds. Foliation may develop dynamics, and this adds to the difficulty of the problem. Well, apart from Kodaira's dimension, there is another point of view that can be used to look at manifolds and also has a foliated version that can, might be applied to foliations. This point of view, as I said, kind of implicitly said, doesn't rely on quadratic dimension, but it also yields some insights on the structure of these objects. I don't plan to talk about any general program or any huge problem. What I'll be talking about is a very concrete problem. And uh, this introduction is to say that this problem sits inside this global picture. It has the advantage of, being, of having a proper interest, which is easy to explain and, uh, well, make the talk kind of self-contained. But I would like to mention this is as much as I want to say about global problems. This problem sits inside a much bigger picture. Actually, just to situate this problem in the picture, uh, this is related to foliations rather than manifolds. So it would be my two issues, my two, two data about the situation of the position of the problem is it deals with foliations, not with manifolds. So dynamics may arise, dynamics will arise, and it's going to be understood the way it arises. And the dimension is not two, but it's three. The dimension of the ambient is three. OK, what is the problem? The problem might be presented in the following way. So assume that x is a holomorphic vector field defined on a neighborhood of the origin holomorphic <coughs> vector field on the neighborhood of the origin of C3. So assume also that X is semi-complete. Well, I recall, I remind you in a second what semi-complete means. And given this vector field would like to understand how is this vector field. We'd like to classify, if possible, all such objects. So describe X. In particular, you may ask the following conjecture, with somehow the central conjecture. If you can solve this conjecture, you probably has technology enough to give you a kind of complete description of this vector field. So uh, say, for instance, the following so the conjecture, let's say. So the second jet of x at the origin cannot vanish, provided that the origin is an isolated singularity of x. Dimension three. Well, I'm not able to answer this question, at least not yet, but I'm able to overcome which might well turn out to be the main obstacle in its solution. And that's exactly what I plan to explain to you today, if time permits. Okay, uh, to begin with, let me briefly remind you what a semi-complete singularity is. 
uh, definition. This is a half definition, not give the formal definition, but kind of half one. So you have x, you have a neighborhood, an open set u, on where x is defined. And x gives rise to a singular foliation on u. So suppose, those well, the foliation of course has singularities. Suppose you take a regular leaf of this foliation. Let L be a regular leaf. So foliation might be F. Well, this is a Riemann surface, and the vector field is tangent to it, and the vector field doesn't vanish on it by definition. So I took a regular surface. So I can consider a dual form to the vector field, a holomorphic form, which I usually call dt, which is defined by imposing that dt evaluated at x equals to 1. So this is a foliated form. It's defined only the tangent space of the leaves. This is time for so roughly speaking, a vector field is semi-complete. If whenever you pick L, you pick dt, the corresponding dt, and you get a curve, a, real, a path, C from 0, 1 into L, which is embedded, in particular open, the integral of dt over C cannot vanish. is always different from zero. So why this is something interesting? Well, the first remark is, assume your vector field is complete. For instance, assume it's globally defined on a compact manifold. Well, in this case, what does this integral represent? Well, the vector field is complete means it has a flow. The integral then represents, so if L is here, and c is here, c0, c1, then the integral represents the time taken by the flow to take c0 to c1, well, in this class of homotopy. Well, this time is not zero. There's no flow that moves one point into another point in zero time. So this condition should be seen, at least at a first, first look, as being a condition that is necessarily satisfied by any singularity which has a chance of being realized by a complete holomorphic flow. Right? In particular, you have this thing. So it's natural. If, if I can say non-trivial things about semi-complete singularities, I have non-trivial theorems about singularities of holomorphic vector fields globally defined, of complete holomorphic vector fields. Well, this is, I'm going to go, this serves as a definition for the time being, at least. And why are they interesting? I want to, well, at least extra reason to be interesting, to provide evidence of the interest of this problem. Let me go back to dimension two and revisit the situation in dimension two. So suppose for a while the dimension of the ambient is two. So in dimension two, semi-complete singularities were completely <laughs> described. Oh, semi-complete singularities. Were classified in detail. And this is partially joined with the changes. Uh, not only in the holomorphic setting, but also in the meromorphic one, allowing X to be meromorphic, to have a polar divisor, even meromorphically. So uh, this thing, this classification, has found a uh, few applications. Let me mention some, three of them. Uh, one first application was uh, there is, there was, let's say, a classical problem in 
complex geometry, which consisted of classifying pairs, compact complex surface, holomorphic vector field on the compact complex surface. So this is an X. M2 and X. So this problem was solved by Drowski, Oji Klaus, and Thoma, and in their solution, this classification played some role. Okay, so found application here. Another application, another classical problem, is the classification, as good, as, a, as good classification as you can get, of complete polynomial vector fields on C2. So this problem was solved the first last year by Brunella through McQuillian's theory. Theory. Uh, not that McQuillian's theory is exactly the point of view of a foliated quadrate dimension. So a little after, I was able to provide an alternate solution, which does not depend on McQuillian theory at all, but that goes through this classification in a way I might mention, probably I have time to briefly mention, briefly give you a hint in a few minutes. So this is to mention that this problem admits a solution through this technology, and in this sense, it also constitutes another part of the general program I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, a third application, which is kind of remark, was when I observed that Quadira's description of rational or elliptic surface also can be viewed as a particular case of this. And actually, well, more or less particular. Essentially, it's not really important, but it's better to consider meromorphic vector fields here. These meromorphic vector fields are semi-complete and uh, they have some further properties so that they not hard to describe. I mean, you don't need the full force of this technology. It's convenient to allow meromorphic things, but you don't have to classify general meromorphic things. So they're very particular, which reflects is a manifestation of the principle that surfaces are easier than foliations. There I was looking at a surface, so I only got a part of my problem, of the general problem, a part which is strictly easier than the general problem. So given these things, it's highly desirable if you could push this classification forward to dimension three. Well, uh, in the same way, you see that you should not be, be too much optimistic, right? Because a description of elliptic trifolds, it's a classical object which is not fully understood despite much interest. There's much interest on these things, not only because it's a classical problem, but more recent interest coming from mirror symmetry considerations and physicists are very interested. And despite, there's of course much work, much things are no, but not, you don't have a picture similar to Kodaira's picture for dimension two. And already here, well, you're looking from this point of view of foliations and manifolds, you look into something that should be strictly easier than the classification in dimension three, right? This the singularities that appear in connection with an elliptic threefold are definitely much simpler than a singularity as the one I'm considering here. Well, the fact is that singularities there, you know, a priori, in a certain sense, they don't develop dynamics. And here they might develop and they do develop 
for instance, you look at the half and vector fields. Okay. So what next I have to say? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, with this said, let me try to convince you. Well, not necessarily to convince you, but to show one sort of explanation why dimension two must be much easier than dimension three. It's not as easy as dimension one, but it still is much easier. It can be treated. And let me give you one possible explanation for this fact. Well, uh, suppose that x is a holomorphic vector field, OK, but we are in dimension 2. The first thing you have to, to consider when you look at differential equations is that essentially the only thing you know how to solve is a one-dimensional differential equation. It's an differential equation of the form dx dt equal to f of x. So this we can solve. You'll say, OK, t is the integral of f, 1 over f. Well, uh, in dimension 2, you don't have general method to integrate differential equations. So this problem is supposed to be very easy in dimension 1, not so easy in dimension 2. But in dimension 2, something happens that allows you kind of reduce the problem to dimension 1. And it happens for free. Well, suppose x is like before. You have f. And you've blown up x, f at the origin. When you do that, what happens is that it appears an exceptional divisor, which is a rational curve, so CP1. In other words, is a one-dimensional object which, uh, well, by very simple consideration for the interesting case, I can suppose is invariant by the foliation. So it contains singularities, but it's invariant for the foliation. And when I mean invariant, I mean genuinely invariant. I mean invariant by the foliation. So for instance, if you look at a vector field like x minus y times x d d x minus y, the y. So for instance, the x y equals 0 is invariant by this thing, is invariant by this vector field. So in terms of foliation, it's invariant by foliation. It's a genuine invariant curve. And x minus x equals to y formally is invariant by the vector field because the vector field vanishes over this line. But it's not invariant by the foliation. So it's not what I said, genuinely invariant. So here you have something genuinely invariant, and then you say, great, I just have to restrict my vector field to this exceptional divisor and see what happens. I must have some information out of it. Well, the difficulty that appears here is that the vector field, however, will vanish identically over the divisor. And then the problem is not so easy, at least not so immediate. But still, it gives you a curve, which is something that might be used and have to be used to, to classify, to work out this classification. Uh, actually, this problem of this vanishing of this vector field over this curve is exactly a problem that can be handled by the renormalization technique that he fitted to in my title. Uh, if I have time, you're going to see this is a special case, very easy to handle with that technique. And this explains why dimension 2 is not too hard. When you go to dimension 3, you immediately see what is the, the first source of difficulty, of extra difficulty. So try to play the same game. Try to blown up a singularity in dimension 3. So when you blow up a singularity, you can, blow, you can make a punctual blown up 
dimension three might have a choice. So make a Poincton blown up, let's say. So now your exceptional divisor is the surface, is CP2. And it has a foliation induced over it. Some foliation. Well, the vector field vanish over it. Well, OK, that's OK. Should not expect anything different. But the point is that this foliation, it doesn't have to have uh, invariant curves. So foliations in CP2, in general, are no, not leave anything invariant, anything algebraic invariant. So you don't have this combination of singularities and over one single curve that in some sense carries all the information of the manifold or of the vector field. Here you don't have to have it. So you might look first, maybe I can prove that if X is semi-complete, I have algebraic invariant curves. This is good, but not yet too good, since it might perfectly happen that I have my CP2 here. Well, let's say I have here an invariant curve, C. This curve contains some singularities, that's all right. But there are other similarities of the foliation of the curve somehow over here. And this doesn't make, it doesn't, still, even though you can play this game here and understand more or less what is going on, there are similarities with you missing. And it doesn't convey all the full information, for instance, on the degree of the single foliation. Right? So what you might hope for would be a probably a useful result in this direction, it would be, well, I have algebraic invariant curves through all the singularities. In other words, I have an algebraic curve, not necessarily irreducible, which contains all the singularities of the foliation induced in the exceptional divisor. So this is exactly what I want to explain the result we have. Okay. All, this is actually not the main result, it's a harder a corollary of the result. Well, let's say theorem A. If I have time, I state theorem B. If, well, <coughs> if uh, more or less it sits naturally inside. So, uh, well, let's say F. E, the foliation induced on the exceptional divisor E, uh, then there's an algebraic invariant curve I'm assuming semi-complete, of course. C is an algebraic invariant curve. Not necessarily irreducible. Containing all the singularities of Fe. Of Fe. Just uh, for the first blown up, for any blown up you want. Yeah. For any blown up you want. Not necessarily a punctual blown up either. I mean, if you have, if you take a slightly more global situation, X is defined on some open set, and uh, inside you have a curve of singularities of X, compact curve, and the vector field is semi-complete on the neighborhood of this curve. If you blown up along the curve, the same result is true. It's not an issue about CP2.
So uh, just a parenthesis, I was planning to mention this thing and actually I skipped it, I forgot. My approach to complete polynomial vector fields in C2 is exactly dual to the approach of semi-complete singularities on dimension two. Uh, the fact is, well, maybe you don't have singularities, or you have only reduced the singularities, and anyway, they don't convey you sufficient information. But if you have, this is parenthesis, okay? Remark. So if you have a complete vector field, polynomial vector field on C2, Well, uh, unless this vector field is linear, let's exclude the case it's linear. The foliation induced by it on CP2, on the nature of compatification, it induces a foliation F on CP2, which leaves the line at infinity invariant, necessarily. invariant. And then the game is, I have, may not have singularities, or singularities itself may not provide sufficient information, but I have a periodic orbit, a natural <coughs> periodic orbit for this. And I might sit Poincaré, who said many years ago, one century ago, that when you look at the differential equation, basically all you can do is to look at singularities and at periodic orbits. So if singularities are not enough, you got for free a periodic orbit. Look at this. So you play exactly the same kind of game. You have a curve, which is again CP1. Over this curve, you've got singularities. Well, here you pay an extra price because the vector field is meromorphic here. This is a polar divisor, it's not a zero divisor, and this adds to the difficulty. But if you can work out the singularities, you can rebuild the vector field on an neighbor root of the infinity. And this allows you to recognize the vector field itself by using an easy trick through Blanchard lemma. Okay, so this was just a parenthesis kind of aimed to emphasize the importance of having periodic curves and look at periodic curves. It really conveys, it seems really to convey relevant information. Okay, uh, so let's go on. How much time is passed? Okay, uh, I will not state, actually theorem A, it might be the corollary of, it's the, it is the corollary of theorem B, which is actually much stronger and would explain exactly in which way a vector foliation like this may have say, a rich dynamics. I will not state it because, well, if I state, it might sound a little surprising, it might sound contradictory, and I have to explain why it's not contradictory, and then it will take me away, I will have no time to say anything about the renormalization technique. So, uh, basically, I well, believe this is an application of renormalization technique, and let's see what is this normalization technique. All right, oh, let's suppose we have a vector field, and uh, we already assume that it has a separatrix, a smooth separatrix. So x is defined on C3, 0. And say the x, y equals z equals 0, is invariant. So x has the form some function times f ddx plus uh, something that can be divided by y and z, 
y k1 some function plus z k2 another function d dy plus uh, same thing for z zl2 h2 d dz Okay, uh, let's suppose also that f x 0, 0, 0 is not identically 0, right? It's not a line of singularities. Well, uh, this would be very easy if the vector field, it's very easy for instance to detect if the vector field is semi-complete or not, if f wasn't there. So f being there, for instance, if f is like y to some power, z to some other power is unclear. If you restrict the vector field to the separatrix, you don't see much, you see zero. So renormalization was exactly, or at least originally, considered to, to sort out what is happening in this case. And the way it goes is as follows. Uh, well, I have my separatrix, I'll take advantage of it. Well, let's see, let's try to draw a picture. Okay. So here is y equals z equals zero. So here is something else, is the rest. And I'll chop off r plus from this picture. R plus is chopped off so that I have a simply connected domain. So on this domain, and if I enlarge this a little bit, I take for instance a compact part, an annulus. Well, this is a regular leaf. And therefore, uh, transverse sections, well, vertical sections are transverse to the other leaves. So I want to open this annulus, enlarge this a little bit to a cylinders, and open it up so as to, to have a horizontal foliation. So looking this into coordinates, I have a map, say R, that goes from, from a cylinder like this, maybe I call this A cross epsilon, A for annulus, epsilon for the vertical direction. And I have this map that maps A cross epsilon to here and takes horizontal lines. Here, lines of the form y equal constant 1, z equals constant 2 in the leaves of F here. So, of course, I can construct this map as a diffeomorphism. That's exactly the reason I chopped R plus off here to not have the effect of the holonomy. So just pick a, a path here, lift this in the natural way to the leaves, and got your map. So more general, this map has the form. I can write this map on the form. R, R x, y, z equals to x some function u, some function v, right? And u and v, because it takes lines into the leaves, u and z verify the following differential equations. Delta u delta x times f is, uh, let's see, u, yeah, I keep my formula there, u to the k1, g1, x, u, v, plus, I guess, uh, v to the k1, g2, x, u, v. And similarly, dv dx times f is the same thing with l and h. h2. Okay. 
And by construction, if I pull back the vector field X over here, I have a horizontal vector field, right? So the vector field R star X, uh, I will close the rest of this form. I have a horizontal vector field. X is F, uh, not F, no, some function. G. No, G, there's also G, let's say function. The dx. Well, the good news is, first, this procedure can be quantified through this, these two differential equations here. So if you quantify this thing, well, okay, not yet. Let's see this vector field again. Now it's a horizontal vector field. And here is my original x, x, x. So y equals z equals zero. And the vector field has zeros, poles over here, I don't know. Well, uh, the vector field is horizontal. So it has a function, at least, let's say, just for a second, pretend you are in dimension two. So the only way is to have, okay, this has to be a factor of y, y to some power, times some regular function of f, x, y, right? Well, if now I move from my polar, my zero divisor, to a close by an if, I got an epsilon here. Well, epsilon is bad but it doesn't make any difference for integration of this function over this curve because epsilon is constant. So the normalization consists of throwing epsilon away and taking in the limit f x zero dx. So if here you have got some holomorphic vector field and if you can prove this holomorphic vector field, f is not the initial f, right, this function. If you can prove this holomorphic vector field is not semi-complete, so there is some open curve over here. C, over which the integral of the corresponding time form, which I will call dt, with a super R for a normalized, is equal zero. Then the original vector field is not semi-complete. And why is that? Well, if this happens here, if I move a little bit up, it also happens for F X epsilon maybe deforming this curve a little bit, because f x epsilon degenerating this thing, and the condition is open. I, and then you say, well, uh, but I had an epsilon in front. Yeah, but it was only an epsilon, it was only a constant. So it makes no difference. So the main point is, if I'm able to evaluate this function, I'm able to tell, at least to a good extent, whether or not the original vector field was semi-complete. So how do you evaluate this function? Well, uh, this is a simple trick after all. You expand, well, in dimension three, all you have to do, you have in principle an extra complication because you have this picture. You must have a two-dimensional slice. You don't care, okay, fix some plane, two-dimensional slice, set y equal lambda z, and let's see what happens. Then with y to lambda z, you have the your epsilon. You do your calculations. And now you expand u and v in Taylor series. You expand everyone in Taylor series. And see what happens. Well, you've got many epsilons around. Some of them may be factored out, some not. And then you factor out those that can. And eliminate, forget them. 
It's a normalization. The remaining terms that contain epsilon really die. And then if you, after eliminating the common factor f epsilon, you set epsilon equals zero, you got your renormalized time form, which satisfies the following equation. Well, uh, yeah, well, two things. The first thing you observe, now let's call these functions C. Okay, let me write some formula. By doing this procedure, if you follow the calculations, you get the following. The vector field, my function, my mysterious functions over there, is of the form f, small f, where f was the function that was multiplying the vector field, of something I will call cu lambda of x and cv lambda of x times f x zero zero. So this lambda is to remind me that I fixed a two-dimensional slice, y equal lambda z. However, what follows from this calculation is that u and this function cu lambda and cv lambda satisfy the following system of equations. cu lambda prime equals to constant some constant, 1, 1. Uh, well, keeping the notation I had, g2 x0, 0, 0 over f0, 0, 0, uh, cu lambda, plus same thing. g3 over f cv lambda. And similarly for CV lambda, some new constant, 2, 1, H2 over F, Cu, plus a constant, 2, 2, H3 over F, CV lambda. Constants are characterized by the following. For what, this constant here, for instance, 1, 1, and analogously for the others, is 1 if uh, k2, I guess. It was the, I had this formula here, y k2 g2 plus z k3 g3 d dy. So if k2 is bigger than 1, no, sorry. If k2 is 1, and is 0 otherwise. In particular, what you see from this system, these functions don't depend on lambda. This function here doesn't depend on lambda. This is a fixed system, and they are solutions. Therefore, they don't depend on lambda, as was to be expected from the very beginning, because, well, they very close related. They are residuals. They are the index. This system somehow measures the index of the separatrix. And, uh, well, the index will vary holomorphically if I vary this slice, and depends only on the normal direction. So if this function after all, it would be a holomorphic function defined on CP1, function of lambda. Therefore, it must be constant. So this system, now I can erase lambda from the story. And I have this thing. Well, in particular, you see the following. Well, there are extra information here, much extra, a lot of extra information in particular concerning this number, well, you have something that in principle has an asymptotic, has essential singularity, except that because it's not really defined around zero. You can kind of rule out the essential singularity by between codes using Picard's theorem and the fact that the vector field is semi-complete. So you end up with something like this. 
So your vector field must be something like this. My function, function d dx, is some x to the a times age, x, where age doesn't vanish. Age is holomorphic. Age is 0, 0, or well, many zeros you want. It's not 0. <coughs> d dx. So there are extra relations which are important concerning the value of a. A doesn't have to be an integer. But a measures the order of the holonomy. So if a is not 1, then the holonomy of the separatrix is finite. Okay. Well, uh, this a is very close. Well, dimension 2 is exactly the index. OK, uh, let's continue a little bit more. In particular, what happens here if I had uh, if zero, if the singularity after all, were a regular point for defoliation? Well, in this case, In this case, I can. I don't need to shop R plus off my picture, right? Because it's a regular. There's no local monodromy anyway. And A, in particular, has to be something integer. And actually, F x 0, 0 is not 0. So we got a holomorphic form defined downstairs. So the moral is If I pick on my CP2, let's say, my exceptional divisor, a piece of regular leaf, this regular leaf is still equipped with a holomorphic differential form, or equivalent with a meromorphic, let's say, I don't say it's a holomorphic or meromorphic, I don't care, meromorphic vector field, which is the dual one again. So this has x, though this is a leaf L, I have x, l, r for normalized. And this vector field has a good property. Guess what? It must be semi-complete. Or the same principle. If I had over l a global long embedded curve over which the integral of the time form vanishes, then I fix a neighborhood of this curve. I play the same game. And I get the same contradiction. So this vector field, it's defined on regular part. It depends on the leaf. The vector field defined on the leaf is not defined everywhere because you have some, for instance, a separatrix with monodromy. And then it's defined on sectorially. You cannot make the turn. But at least if you pick a leaf without holonomy, and there are many of those leaves, you have a globally defined vector field tangent to the leaf. And this vector field is semi-complete. Well, if it's semi-complete, how much time do I still have? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay, thank you. Now I'm coming closer to the contradiction, but it'll be closer. It will be clear the explanation for the contradiction, too. Not be surprising to some experts. If it is semi-complete, I can, after all, consider it semi-complete flow. So you have a map, phi, from some open set, some open set omega of C cross L into L which, is, uh, which has, satisfies the properties of a local flow for x, namely phi t1 plus t2x is phi t1 plus of phi t2x, if everyone is defined. The derivative of phi is x. And the non-trivial condition, which corresponds to the semi-complete condition, if I have a sequence ty going to some point in the boundary of omega, 
then the corresponding sequence phi ti must go to the boundary of L. In other words, it must leave any compact set on L. Sets on L. All right. So what? Suppose, for instance, just for kind of joke, is obvious a situation that obviously can't happen. Not so obviously, but it can't happen at least after the well-known theorems for semi-complete flow or for minimal sets. Suppose that L were an exceptional leaf. Well, if L were an exceptional leaf, it doesn't accumulate any singularity, and it has this form, this vector field, defined over it. Again, it doesn't accumulate singularity, so it's very easy to see this vector field is bounded. Because this construction is bounded on CP2. CP2 is compact, even though it's not defined everywhere. So how can it happen? How can you have a point? Well, yeah. How can you have a point if you fix a point P in origin P and start moving P around through the semi-global flow? How can you go from a finite point and quit any compact set on L? You cannot. If you approach some finite point, this thing is bounded and therefore has a limit, which means L is C, or C star. But it's definitely not hyperbolic. So this map, if L is an exceptional leaf, omega, at least fixing P, omega is the entire C. Omega is complete, is C cross L. And then, particularly, the leaves are hyperbolic. Oh, sorry, the leaves are planar. Well, uh, then you get close to, for instance, McQuillian's theorem. And I'm getting close to my contradiction. If you have integer, integral curves tangent to the foliation, then, according to McQuillian, your foliation is transverse to a rational or elliptic vibration. In particular, it holds theorem A, and it holds even more. I mean, I exactly, I can't have anything but to develop a rich dynamics, I can't have anything that doesn't look like a Riccati equation, because it has to be transverse to CP1. Well, uh, however, you have some difficulty here, some extra difficulty, because L has all right of accumulating singularities. It may accumulate as a separatrix. It may go through the singularity. Well, many times, maybe. Infinitely many times. And that's what happens. Or it can even accumulate without being a singularity, or without being a separatrix. Accumulate in some bad, wild way. And this case has to be analyzed in detail. Right? And when we analyze it in detail, we actually get theorem B which states that there is an integral curve tangent to Fe. Tangent to F. Well, again, it doesn't mean that the foliation or the leaves of the foliation fought in the usual sense are not hyperbolic. What is the integral curve? Well, as a map from C, ah. an entire map from C. Uh, it doesn't mean that the leaves are, are not hyperbolic because this map has a wild behavior. In particular, it might go infinitely many times through singularities. So that's exactly, just to, to close, let me just mention, draw a short picture more for experts of a half and vector field of the foliage, what happens in the case of half and vector fields. So half and vector field is something, well, I can refer to the Gilou's thesis. I think 
he didn't publish it yet, so thesis. The own, uh, anyone of the year? 2002? So for this picture, uh, okay, you have this vector field, you blow it up, and up to blow it up once again in a point, it doesn't make any difference at all. All these things are invariant by blown ups. You have the following picture in deceptional divisor. Deceptional divisor is a bundle of a CPU1, CPU1 cross CPU1. And the foliation induced is a recut foliation of its transverse to the fibers. There are three singular fibers, three invariant fibers. And the leaves go around transversely. So the leaf itself, in the usual sense, it's a covering of CP1 minus three points. And therefore the hyperbolic. However, here you have dicritical singularities. And all these leaves come, and if you complete, if you add the singularity to the leaf, it comes and go across. So if you're starting playing the game, every time I get here, I complete my leaf, I add the singularity, I, after all, get a covering of CP1 minus two points, minus one point. And there's no contradiction any longer. This com this com Completement doesn't have to be hyperbolic. Okay, and this explains the apparent contradiction in the statement with half and vector fields. I think I'm out of time, so that's all I want to say. Thank you for your attention.